I'm Rovek, producer and host of the SG Explained podcast. I started SG Explained when I came back from overseas, so I didn't understand anything about HDB, CPF, or some of the things people were saying about what it meant to be a Singaporean. And so I decided to explore it together with my friend Elliot as a co-host. Yes, it's episode three of the new season of SG Explained. Do, do, do. We really just take a topic that people seem to say is part of our identity, unpack it, and really discover what it means for us. We've done really fun topics like soccer, to serious topics like racism, to even some of my more favorite episodes around history of Singapore, like merchants of Singapore. One of the topics I've always wanted to do is a true crime podcast. But actually, the murder cases in Singapore right now are at a low rate. And a few headline grabbers I know all happened after Singapore's independence in 1965. So I want to do an episode where we look at some of the landmark murder cases in Singapore pre-independence, pre-1965. I don't know too much about law and order systems back then. Was there a major event or a major crime that shaped our law and order system today? Before 1965, I mentioned Singapore was a much, much rowdier place where maybe law and order wasn't as set up. So I'm interested to find out what are some of the landmark murder cases that happened in Singapore and what were some of the juicy details about the murder cases back then. The first thing I'm going to do is to look at news archives in Singapore. And I find many, many reports of murder and suspicious deaths from the extremely gruesome like this one from 1929. A Sikh watchman was badly mutilated with his arms severed from his body and you know, separated apart as if it's almost like an art piece of its own. Wow. To the morbidly random. Two Chinese were charged for depositing a corpse in People's Park. That's right next to where I live. It seems like murder was very casual, maybe even frequent. Keeping safe in Singapore back then was definitely no walk in the park and I find what I'm looking for quickly enough. It's this one, it says, Singapore's most sensational trial makes it a very easy candidate for the show. And it's about a man who in 1934 was arrested for killing Inspector Popejoy. According to the article, the murder happened on the 9th of March, 1934. 27-year-old British police inspector Albert Popejoy and a Chinese detective were visiting a pawn shop for an investigation. But as soon as they entered, a young Cantonese man hurried out. That aroused Hope Joy's suspicions, who immediately called the man back in. As the Chinese detective approached to question him, the man suddenly pulled out a gun and fired three shots, two of them seriously wounding the detective and one killing Pope Joy instantly. He then ran off and disappeared into the streets. The killer may have been attached to a robber gang, so there's some gang elements here which make it a bit more sinister and apparently there was a huge manhunt for this man. The month-long manhunt for a Cantonese man matching descriptions of the killer was at a scale Singapore had never seen. The police executed one of its biggest raids in history, hitting more than 30 gang enclaves in a single night. And they didn't stop there. They put up roadblocks across the country causing traffic jams and disrupting commuters everywhere. They combed the docks too, and even searched the steamer based on a tip. In total, over 300 people were arrested. Even a Chinese diplomat was not spared. That's just a lot of people. And the fact that it's a Chinese man killing a European guy, that's probably a lot of tension that was happening back then. From the many arrests, they eventually singled out 20-year-old Cantonese Mark Wing Chung a suspected gang member who was found guilty and hanged in the same year in 1934. What's surprising is that there was such a dramatic police reaction, even though it was just a shooting. I suspect it's because of the gang element here. If my hunch is right, what was it about the gang's den that triggered such an intense police response? The gangs used to meet at coffee shops, kopitiam like this. Who better to talk about crime and retribution than a man of God, Pastor Neville Tan? And word on the street is, he has inside knowledge on gangs in pre-independence Singapore. 
How do you know so much about gangs? I used to be a gang member once. No way. In fact, I was one of the leaders of the gang. Oh, wow. Pastor Tan tells me that he joined a gang in the 1950s when he was only 15. As he rose through the ranks, he learned about the ways of the underworld, including its past. So why do you think there was such a big reaction to one shooting? Well, that case happened even before I was born. All I can tell you is what I hear from the rumours that go around in the underworld. Nobody except the gangs can do it. There were several gangs struggling to take control of Singapore. And so the police wanted to put an end to the gangs. There were clashes and shootings were rampant at the time. And you can see from this newspaper clipping, Singapore was a Chicago of the East. Chicago because of the Mafia? Uh-huh. Okay, wow. Because the gangs at that time were actually secret societies. Pastor Tan explains that secret societies were different from gangs in that they were more organised with strict codes of law. They even had unique signs for communicating, ranging from special hand signals to how you place your teacup during gang negotiations. If your spoon is that way, that means the problem is still open and men who are initiated even get uh, certificates with seals like this. Pastor Tan says that if Mark Wing Chung was indeed a secret society member, he would have followed the same codes even in the 1930s. And Pastor Tan suspects Wing Chung might have enlisted simply to survive on the streets, just like he did. In fact, that was why early Chinese immigrants established secret societies here in the 19th century as a support system in a new frontier. Their powerful support network proved irresistible to many even after they moved into crime, becoming Singapore's largest criminal force right up till the 1970s. So this, this fight between the police and the gangs had been going on for a long time? Oh yes, and there was uh, a lot of strong arm tactics. What do you mean by strong arm tactics? To make his point, Pastor Tan shows me an article from 1937, three years after Wing Chun, or Little Cockroach, was convicted and hanged for Pope Joy's murder. The day he was brought up for trial, right. he came out with a big black eye. And apparently, he only made the confession after the injury. So you think in this case, the person was coerced to do it? That's the whisper underground. Right. I never knew that secret societies had such a pervasive influence. And with their criminal presence as the backdrop of the Pope Joy murder, I'm now wondering if there's more to the trial, especially after reading the article Pastor Tan shared. With the questionable confession, the black eye, it seems like the conviction of Mark Wing Chun or Little Cockroach might not necessarily have been the right one. I am a producer of a local podcast series, SG Explained, which discusses all things Singapore. And I'm developing a new true crime episode on the fatal shooting of a British police inspector, Albert Popejoy, in 1934. The man convicted for the murder was Mark Wing Chung, aka Little Cockroach, who is said to be a secret society member. But after learning about Little Cockroach's questionable confession, I'm starting to, well, question the fairness of the trial. So I dig into the news archives for more details on the court proceedings. It seems like this whole case is very biased. Because now I discover that all seven members of the jury were European. For a trial of a Cantonese man in Singapore, I find that quite suspicious. We actually had the jury system from 1826 to 1970. So I consult legal historian Professor Kevin Tan about my skepticism on the fairness of Little Cockroach's trial. So I have doubts about the verdict of the case, especially with regards to the jury selection, because it seems like even the jury selection may have been a bit rigged. How were the jury selected for such a case? In those days, the law required the government to publish a list of people who were eligible for jury duty. So for example, is the list for 1932. So you put the names in the ballot and then the names would be drawn out. Seems fair. 
but Professor Tan tells me that for complex trials like Little Cockroaches, the proceedings were entirely in English. So this called for a special jury of English speakers, and back then, they would mostly be Europeans. Now don't forget Little Cockroach, he was allegedly a member of a secret society group. And if you were selected for jury duty and you were a Chinese, there is a very high likelihood that you might decline because you fear secret society members could take revenge on you. So that's probably why only the Europeans were able to join the jury in this it's case. It's possible, right? Yeah. We, we, we don't have enough data. What else did the court do in order to, you know, increase the credibility of the trial? The court enforced contempt rules very seriously. Professor Tan explains that these rules protect the judge and jurors from any external influence. And the court actually fined two local newspapers for jumping the gun and calling Little Cockroach the murderer. On top of that, the court appointed Vincent Knowles, one of the best criminal lawyers at the time, as Little Cockroach's defense counsel. And Knowles fought formidably to defend Little Cockroach's innocence, arguing that the confession was not made voluntarily. This is very unusual, but you mustn't forget that they launched probably uh, the biggest manhunt of the day. In fact, um, quite a number of people wrote to the press. They were very unhappy with the way that the police were conducting their search. So the colonial authorities couldn't let that turn into something anti-state. They did what they could to try and show that this is British justice at its best. Despite the show of might by the authorities, Professor Tan says secret societies continued to be a powerful threat well into the late 20th century. So much that the authorities turned to radical measures over the years. In fact, they even had this idea of having a penal settlement. This was the Pulau Senang experiment. There was an effort to reform the so-called hardcore criminals. I'm a bit more reassured that maybe this trial was fair. But the trial of Little Cockroach just got a lot juicier. This was happening against a much larger backdrop, a power play between the secret societies and the police and governments of that day. This is a spicy case. I like this. Spicy, spicy. It's now time for me to share what I found with my partner in crime, Elliot. I want to pick his brains on the story before I script the podcast. So they arrested 300 over people. It was just to find this guy. I found out that was probably because of secret society links. And I share some of the efforts the authorities made to eradicate secret societies. It wasn't just, you know, passing laws and acts. There was, in fact, this experiment on an island, the Pulau Senang Penal Settlement. So that's interesting, because Senang in Malay, right, means like easy, it's a good vibe sort of thing. I don't know how that relates to any of these gang things. So I'm wondering whether this has any bearing on, you know, how they stamped out secret societies back then, because we don't really face a yeah, brunt of it right now. Exactly. So, so you think I should go find out more about this too? Definitely. I think it could be a good key and a good crux for our, our episode. Lah. Was the Pulau Senang penal settlement the solution to Singapore's secret society problem? I meet with Dr. Hamza Muzaini, the man to look for when you need answers on historical spaces and places. Dr. Hamza, what exactly was the Pulau Senang penal settlement? Pulau Senang um, penal settlement was located 15 kilometers away from the mainland. It was established in 1960 um, as a way to cope with the overcrowding that was taking place at prison at that time which Dr. Hamza tells me was a result of the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act of 1955 that allowed suspected criminals to be detained without trial, most of them members of secret societies. It was experimental because it is based on the philosophy that people can actually be rehabilitated through hard work. I've got footage here that shows you the early days uh, when the first batch of um, men were sent to the island. <laughs> And it is quite a sight. Hardcore criminals, many in their early 20s, obediently clearing the island and building the foundations of their own imprisonment. They could also learn new skills they could use for life after prison. Dr. Hamza points out that these prisoners were even allowed to roam freely, with no walls or shackles to confine them, and the wardens did not carry firearms. This was the heart of the experiment, the trust given to prisoners. 
That's quite yeah. progressive for the 1960s too. Yeah, definitely. It was one way in which they can actually get early release within 12 to 18 months. Were all of these people ex-secret society members? The people on the island they were primarily um, secret society members who they saw had the potential to be rehabilitated. Many think that secret society members were all Chinese, but there were other races as well. So what's the status of the penal settlement now? I've not actually heard of it. As it's become a black spot in Singapore's history. In 1963, there was actually a riot on the island where the detainees rose against the officers. Oh, wow. And the island they were actually burned down to the ground. In fact, um, I have some um, photos here. Dr. Hamza tells me that at that time, the wardens were outnumbered by the inmates 7 to 1. In the mayhem, four people were killed, including the superintendent who was burnt alive. Everything happened within an hour. And when the police arrived, they actually found some of the inmates celebrating, thinking they had conquered the island. A few tried to escape, but none succeeded. Till today, nobody really knows what triggered the riot, and the experiment was never repeated. Pulau Senang is now used by the Singapore Armed Forces as a live firing area and off limits to the public. So all these people that the police rounded up, what happened to them? 59 people were actually put to trial. In fact, the room that we are in right now is, is where many of the men would have been as they are waiting for their time to go into court. 18 of them were found guilty uh, of murder. They were sentenced to be hung. It was the longest and largest trial to ever take place in Singapore. What I liked about the Pulau Sinang penal settlement was that it was a good faith attempt at rehabilitating a bunch of prisoners. It was a way to change how people in the secret societies could see their lives. But it was also really unfortunate that all of the trust was taken advantage of and the riot happened. This story about Pulau Sinang, the rehabilitation efforts, adds texture to how Singapore was dealing with lawlessness. So I definitely want to add this into our episode. But first, I have a final discussion with Elliot on what I've discovered about the 1960 Palau Senang penal settlement. So this is how they kind of stem out secret societies in what, the 1960s, right? The result was very short-lived, but I just thought this was a fascinating chapter for this episode. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I think one thing that we're missing from here is that watershed point between 1960s and right now, secret societies, you know, their presence is not even felt. It's yeah. super low. Uh, we have low murder rates, low crime, but how did we get there? Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, let me do a bit more research. We have a comprehensive angle on this. I'm a producer and co-host of a local podcast examining Singapore called SG Explained. For the next episode, I've been looking into one of Singapore's biggest trials, the trial of Little Cockroach for the murder of Inspector Albert Popejoy in 1934. It's led me to learn about secret societies and how the authorities were determined to loosen their criminal hold over Singapore right into the late 20th century. Which brings me to my final question. What was the silver bullet that finally wiped them out and shaped us into one of the safest countries in the world? I've heard of people like police officers getting shot in gangland fights. I meet Michael, who grew up in the 60s and remembers the days when secret societies still control the streets. Hey Michael, so we know that the police eventually managed to eradicate secret societies. But what were you observing as, as they did that? Caning had a big impact. Because I know in my school I had guys in secret societies. Going to jail was like the rite of passage. But when the caning started, holy smoke, you know, it was a game changer. <laughs> Michael tells me that the 1970s was the beginning of the end for secret societies, when a newly independent Singapore took a zero-tolerance approach towards them. They faced harsher punishments, such as caning, for their usual offences like extortion and rioting. Their income also took a hit when stricter laws were passed against vices like gambling and soliciting. Coupled with a stronger, larger police force hot on their tails, the secret society's criminal reign on the streets finally came to an end. And then the 1973 Arms Offences Act required all guns to be stored in the shooting range. You can own a gun, but you couldn't keep guns at home. 
So they took guns off the street. Wait, so back then when you were growing up, people could keep guns at home? Oh, we had guns at home. You had guns at home? Yeah. Wow. My father was a gun owner. Of course, you had to register them. I understand in the early days, guns were so easily available. You just walk in the shop and buy a gun and use that. And true enough, Michael shows me newspaper ads from the 1920s promoting different firearms. Apparently, you could simply walk into department stores like Robinson's to buy a gun as long as you got a government-issued license. This was the norm since 1913, when gun ownership was first legalized here. But by 1937, gun regulations were tightened due to the growing problem of gun violence, illegal possession, and smuggling. Despite this, the situation continued to worsen, and from the 1950s, people lived in a climate of anxiety. Shootouts and other gun crimes made regular headlines. The terror only ended when the death penalty was imposed for firearm offenses in 1973. We grew up knowing there were places we should not go to. So it was a different world from, but now everywhere is fine. The laws and the way the police handled it changed everything. Hearing from Michael just reinforced my understanding that life back then, people were living with apprehension, with fear. The fact that you couldn't go in certain neighborhood, that's a very different kind of climate from what we know today in Singapore. And I just couldn't imagine being in that state of mind. How amazing that a simple investigation into a murder has led me to discover Singapore's difficult journey into becoming one of the safest countries in the world. Now that I have a conclusion for the script, I can't wait to record the podcast with Elliot. Hello, hello. Welcome to a special episode of SG Explained. And it's all around this famous murder that happened back in the 1930s, the murder of Inspector Pope John. And the accused was 20-year-old Cantonese Mark Wing Chung, I'm very excited to talk about this. We have never covered a crime case. Exactly. In this episode, it would not be fair to just talk about the murder in isolation. So I think we're gonna take a classic SG Explain format to this. We're gonna take a big picture approach. The secret society's issue was a complex problem that required a varied and broad approach. The law and order standards that we've achieved now isn't the result of a straightforward set of policies. And that shows me that it has to be experimentation, it has to be a persistent pursuit of peace and justice to get to where we are right now, and it's something precious to protect. We're gonna be exploring like the underground dark spaces of Singapore's shady past. That's gonna be really fun. Absolutely. Okay, listeners, I hope you're excited. Let's dive right in.